Good morning. Welcome to the October 21st uh, CalHFA Board of Directors Audit Committee meeting. Um, this morning we have several presentations. The uh, board package or committee package is in the handout section of your control panel. It's also a public comment guide for reference. Um, we will begin shortly. There will be an opportunity for the public to provide comment. At that time, we'll provide additional instructions. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the chair of the audit committee, Ms. Delilah Sotelo. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to virtually see everyone. <laughs> Hello. Um, so if I can ask folks to mute their phones when they're not speaking, that might make the transmission um, a little better. Um, let's go ahead and start the meeting. Um, Melissa, can you please do a roll call for us? Yeah. Um, Treasurer Ma? Here. Ms. Sotelo? Sotelo? Here. Mr. Gunning? Here. Uh, Chair Sotelo, we have a quorum. Wonderful. Um, well, um, if I can first um, ask the committee members to please um, approve the minutes of the May 27th meeting. Um, if there's any changes or any comments, um, I guess we can go over them right now. But if not, um, is there any objection to approving the minutes of May 27th? None from me. Okay, great. Um, so Treasurer Mauve, no objections. We'll go ahead and deem those minutes approved. Um, item number three. Um, um, I'm going to go ahead and reserve my my comments um, on the committee side um, for um, item number seven, where we can have a discussion about review of the audit committee charter. Um, but I have no comments now other than to say, welcome, Tina. Um, it's our first audit committee meeting together. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good agenda today. I just want to welcome you again. and. Um, uh, welcome your team. Um, so with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lori. Well, good morning, everyone, um, especially uh, Audit Committee Chairperson Ms. Sotelo and members of the Audit Committee. Um, I'm Lori Hamahashi, and I'm the Comptroller for CalHFA. Uh, today, I'll just be providing you with a brief update on the annual audit. Um, the annual audit for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021, began earlier this month. Um, our auditors, Mr. Morris and Allen, are currently focused on two areas right now in the interim part of the audit. Uh, they're looking at the single audit of the federal programs, which uh, it will be Section 8 program and the Section 8, 811 program that we administer. Um, this year, the Section 811 program um, crossed a threshold making it a major federal program for this year, meaning that it will be audited to the extent that Section 8 is fully audited. So we'll be having a little, you know, special or additional report on Section 811 this year. Um, we also are at the same time on the working on the interim procedures for the regular housing finance fund side of it. Um, as of today, the audit is going smoothly. Uh, we've already prepared audit schedules for their review um, and sent out audit confirmations for all our related balance sheet items. Um, in early November, CLA is planning to begin their final audit procedures on the Housing Finance Fund. And it is expected that they'll be done with everything but the other post-employment benefits or the OPEB and pension um, reviews by the end of November. So everything but that will be ready. Uh, we do this year have to wait for the OPEB and pension information to arrive from the state controller's office before we can book the required entries, make the proper disclosures in order to produce the 630 2020 financial statements, and then continue on and complete the ACFR or the annual comprehensive financial report and PAFR, or the popular annual financial report. Uh, both of those reports, again, will be submitted to the Government Finance Officers Association for the reporting awards uh, once they're ready. Um, our fiscal team, um, again, 
we know that we always have to wait for the information the SEO um, each year. We've reached out to them and tried to get a more exact delivery date on the OPEB and uh, pension information. But uh, what they're telling us right now is that the pension information will most likely not be ready until early to mid-January um, due to the lateness of the state's June 30th, 2020 ACFR, uh, which has not been released yet. Um, based on what we see posted on, on their websites, um, they are hoping to release it in November, so next month sometime. Um, regarding OPEB, uh, there's no response from the SEO as to when that information will be ready. Um, if it's anything like last year, they were very close to being released in the same week. You know, maybe I think they were a day apart or things like that. It's just that uh, last year we ran into problems with the OPEB um, information or other post-employment benefits information. Um, what I can tell you is that um, we will continue to follow up with the SEO team on the delivery timeline. Um, as it has changed multiple times over the previous years, as I believe that some of the other audit committee uh, team members know. Um, well, that's all I have right now. And this concludes my update on where we are with the annual audit. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Committee members, are there any questions? Not for me. Mm. Member. Uh... Treasurer Chair, I also noticed that Noah Starr is on the line with us. Are there any other questions? Uh, Treasurer Chair? Um, okay, I think she's on mute. No, no, no questions, no questions from me. Okay, great. Um, so, Lori, I just, um, is there anything that we as the uh, audit committee or as the board can do to help um, understand the timeline? Um, you know, from you know, um, so that we're not we don't find our ourselves in the same position as we did last year. Just just understand uh, the timeline of when we're going to get um, the audits from the from the state. Um, I mean, as they explained to us before, that they have their you know they have a pretty robust review process on their side, and they also have to um, go through an audit of 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 the information that they're releasing. So mm -hmm. if there's any delays with their audit and getting that audit report uh, finalized, then that ultimately affects us and there's nothing we can really do. I mean, it's, at that point, it's between the client and the auditors to resolve whatever issues they have. And so, you know, we're, we're getting it and what we're told we're getting it as soon as it is, you know, humanly possible to get us the report so that we can finish, you know, and conclude our audit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, keep us posted, Lori. We really appreciate your, your update. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, go to the 2021 security update. Um, I think we have uh, Ashish uh, Kumar and Russell. Are you on the line? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Let me turn it over to you guys. All right, very good. Can uh, everybody hear me? All right, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Chairman, Ms. Sotelo, members of the audit committee, my peers, staff, and members of the public, a very good morning to you all. My name is Ashish Kumar, and I'm the Chief Information Officer for California Housing Finance Agency. It is my privilege once again to inform you about our information security and cybersecurity updates uh, for 2021. Next slide, please. Now, today I'm here with Russell Nakao, our Chief Information Security Officer for the agency. And our goal is to provide an update on how we are managing our cybersecurity and managing risks along the way. Now, before we dive into the updates, let me uh, talk about cybersecurity and what Kalish Bay is doing in this space. Next slide, uh, next slide please. Now, what is cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is a practice or a process of protecting systems, networks, and programs from digital attacks. Now, these digital attacks, and sometimes, and many of us may know this as cyber attacks, are usually aimed at changing, accessing, and then destroying sensitive information 
more like extorting money from users and also interrupting normal business processes. Now, what is cybersecurity all about at Calajiffe? And what are we doing in this area to keep us safe? Now, our cybersecurity approach has multiple layers of protection spread across our computers, our networks, our programs, and the data that we intend to keep safe. Cybersecurity is a process. At Calachipe, it is a process that is built around our people, our processes, and technology. Now let's look at some of the areas on how and what are some of the things that we're doing around people, processes, and technology. Next slide, please. So when we look at people, we ensure that our users understand and comply with basic data security principles like choosing strong passwords, be wary of attachments in emails, and backing up data. We have at CalHFA implemented a strong 15 character password policy. We offer regular ongoing security trainings and phishing tests to identify wary emails. And our enterprise backup system allows our network drives and other essential applications to be safely backed up in both cloud and offsite storage. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at processes. Calhfa has a framework for how we deal with both attempted and successful cyber attacks. We haven't had one, but we have a process in place for that. We have information security policy manual, which outlines the policies, the procedures, and processes around information security. The manual is in line with federal and state regulations and industry best practices, and we I update the manual regularly, and it also gets audited. When we bring new employees on board, their experiences ensures that they are made aware of the policies that we have in place. We make, we make them aware of the phone numbers that they need to call or who to call when there is an information security incident, or if they have any questions around information security. Next slide, please. The last pillar is the technology element. Now this is essential and it gives CalHFA and its staff the much needed computer security tools needed to protect ourselves from cyber attacks. There are three entities that technology is built around. First is our endpoints. These are your computers, these are your laptops, smart devices, routers, and then we look at our networks. And then finally, the cloud element. Some of the common technology that we have put in place in these areas are firewalls. Firewall is a tool that allows us to see what's coming into our traffic. We also use netting. Netting is a, tool, a term used which only me means that only authorized users can connect onto our resources. We have malware protection, we have antivirus protection, and then we also have email security solutions. Now, I just mentioned some of the things that we're doing in this space when it comes to technology. There's other initiatives that we have taken that keeps us safe and secure. Now, let's, so the next part of the presentation, I will uh, introduce Russell Macau to take over and, and he will be talking about some of the mitigating strategies that we have worked on in the past year. So Russell, your turn. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, good morning, everybody. So like she said, cybersecurity is the practice of protecting systems, networks, and programs from digital attack. And this morning, we're going to talk about a few things about uh, mitigating our cybersecurity risks here at CalHFA. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to be talking about these three main things. The AB670, which is the Independent Security Assessment email security features, and our security information and events management tool, also called a SIM. Next slide, please. So everything we do here at College of is to protect from ransomware and phishing. So over the years, there's been a huge, huge increase in the number of ransomware and phishing attacks. And so these attacks continue to rise and are getting more dangerous with cyber criminals attempting to encrypt as much of a corporate network as possible. 
And a single attack can result in cyber criminals making hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, uh, not to mention the loss of trust we would have in protecting our users' information. So CalHFA Information Technology Division has been working on protecting our staff and data. Next slide, please. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is AB 670, which is the Independent Security Assessment. So this year, our partners at Clifton Larson Allen did a assessment on our network as a whole. And so how they did this, there's three different pieces to it. One was an internal vulnerability test, so inside our network environment. Uh, the other one was externally, so a random person outside, they were testing our systems getting in. And then also we had a web application uh, testing. And so all of this data was put into a report that had observations and findings of these 32 different control objectives that um, the state of California has as a requirement. And so with this information, we're able to see where we're doing well and where we're a little bit lacking. And so with this document, Throughout the year, we have meetings to mitigate the findings that Clifton Larson Ellen has found in order to give us a better security posture. Next slide. Email security features. So I'm not gonna go into all the details about the different acronyms like DMARC, SPF, and DKIM, but basically what these protocols and applications are doing is protecting our our brand, so our at calhfa.ca.gov. So I don't know if most people have heard, but sometimes you can get spoofed, or basically someone can mimic that you are from CalHFA and send out phishing campaigns. So we've put a lot of different security features in place in order to protect our at calhfa.ca.gov domain, so it's more difficult for an individual or a hacker to leverage those accounts. Next slide, please. We also implemented a SIM, which is a security information and events management system. So it's a bird's eye view into our system. So as she was talking about, we have endpoints, we have servers, we have routers. Basically, all of those devices have logs. And individually, those logs are difficult to read. We can't correlate information to see if a certain event is actually a malicious attack. But with this SIM, basically, it aggregates all of our logs into one location, which gives us a better understanding of, hey, you know, a log here triggered this event here, which, you know, could be inducive of an attack. So it gives us a very good overview of our systems as a whole. The other thing that the SIM brought us was a 24 seven external security operations center monitoring. So we don't have a huge amount of staff dedicated to security here at CalHFA, but with this team augmenting our, our CalHFA team, we're able to have 24 seven monitoring. So which is a which is great because we haven't had that in the past. Next slide, please. The last thing we're gonna talk about is we've created and implemented conditional access policies for our Office 365 remote use. So Office 365 encompasses everything from Outlook to Teams to Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and all the Microsoft applications. So what we've done is we put these policies in place which allow us to actively monitor the data remotely and how it's getting accessed. Because everything's kind of moving to the cloud and with cloud comes ease of use, but also creates a bigger attack vector for us. Next slide, please. And so that is what we have done in 2021 and looking ahead to 2022, next slide, please. We're gonna focus on leveraging our existing security tools. So now with some dedicated security staff, we're gonna be able to consistently manage and monitor our digital environment 
Um, so it'll allow us to be more proactive than reactive. We're going to sit there, you know, daily looking at logs, looking at our SIM and seeing, seeing attacks that, you know, we might not have seen before. So again, being proactive rather than reactive. And the next thing on our list, next slide please, is also creating and implementing more policies for Office 365, um, mainly with our devices. Because again, now we can connect via our iPhone or our iPad or laptops. Um, and so we're just going to have a better overview of how each, each user or each um, yeah, user is connecting and we'll be able to monitor the data use. Next slide, please. And that concludes our presentation. Are there any questions for either Ashish uh, or myself? No, but congratulations on such a comprehensive presentation and uh, approach. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Um, the one question I do have is uh, the third part, party monitoring, um, the survey you did, are those results, um, can those results be published or when will we have, um, you know, when, when can we make uh, the board aware of the results? For the independent security assessment? Mm -hmm. We just do like a snippet for the for the board to take a look at and, and, and see how well we're doing. Yeah, we could do that. Ashish, do we, will we go over individual yeah, so, uh, yeah, Russell, what we can do is, uh, uh, Delilah, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Sakala, for your question. And uh, we do have those results that we can share with the board. Um, however, um, the nature of, uh, I, I think, uh, in, a, in a bigger picture, we can do how, like, how many P's we have, how many I's we had, and how many N's we had. But yes. The, the detail, yeah, we, we can definitely. Right, not, not where they are, right? <laughs> okay. That's why we want to make that public. No, no, just overall, just how well we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> not a roadmap to. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I should have been clearer. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, I think it would just be, you know, nice to get a, an overview of that and how we're, how we're doing in terms of that. Perfect. Members of the committee, are there any other questions or, or comments? I just had one. Um, how long have we had a security officer? Long time. I thought Ashish, it was just you and Chief. I thought Ashish yes. was a security officer before he came, became director. Hmm. Ah, okay, right. That's right. I remember. Okay. Yeah. So we've, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Gunning, for, for that question. We've always had a information security officer transition back to a chief information security officer. Um, however, what Russell was also mentioning as far as expanding that team is we are, uh, it used to be a one person shop, right? Uh, and now what we have done is we've dedicated IT resources, meaning that we have built a team and then now Russell being a, a, a chief information security officer also has a staff to support him with the security initiatives. And then down the road and in, in the years down the road, our plan is to grow some of those functionality and then build our security team. But because what we have seen is information security is becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, ransomware is on a rise, as Russell mentioned, and some of these controls that we've put in place is to protect us from that, from that, uh, from that to happen. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, so we've always had a CISO or a security officer. I don't have um, anything. Else. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, congratulate the team on this uh, excellent presentation. Um, also wanted to mention that my on onboarding process was just stellar. Um, just that you know, I failed the test two times, but I finally got over the hump of for fishing. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, beyond that, I also just wanted to mention some of the things that I've seen them do recently in terms of trying to educate the staff on how to uh, put some technical security controls, share that with our, our children and, and, and our folks that was recently published in the Insider. I thought that that was excellent work. It's so that 
it goes beyond just what happens here, but also to help us um, as we are working with our own friends and families on how to do this, how to protect ourselves best. So kudos to the team for taking it above and beyond, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with their work uh, in this area. Wonderful. Thank you. And congratulations again. That's great. Um, so with that, um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Rebecca Franklin uh, for the CalHFA State Leadership Accountability Act report. Um, and Rebecca, you're going to slay it, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, one of my my team members that's what she if i'm like how's it going she's like i'm slaying it i'm slaying it that's her like <laughs> mantra um so she'll appreciate it. I'm, I'm assuming she's watching right now so uh <laughs> good morning chair satello and members of the audit committee as you know i'm rebecca franklin direct the current director of enterprise risk management and compliance last month i did update you guys on the mortgage relief program and i said you know it was happy update rather than my risk update but i'm gonna take that back i think risk can be fun and exciting too so hopefully this doesn't bore you but today i'm here to update you on the state leadership accountability act next slide as you're well aware the state leadership accountability act also known as the slay is mandated by law um, every public agency and organization is required to submit a full report at, by December 31st of each odd number year. That report contains an overview of our control environment, an assessment of our internal controls effectiveness, and identification of the top risks of the enterprise. Uh, next slide goes over the kind of the high-level timeline of the SLAY report as we create it. So, we started off doing an enterprise risk survey with the senior leaders and decision makers of the agency to identify any top risks that we felt was necessary to incorporate into the report. Those risks were identified and then we had cross-functional meetings with the different um, senior leaders who contribute to the control environment that that risk covers. I was really excited. One of the reasons why I wanted this job so much was when Don, um, explained CalHFA's approach to risk management being one that is integrated into the business lines and the programs and is a seat at the table and is cross-functional in nature. I really thought that was a really great approach to managing risk because risk is not completed in silos, it's completed in handoffs and collaborative things. So I really appreciated CalHFA's approach to risk management and so we really wanted to incorporate that in the SLAY report. So we're kind of in the middle section right now. I thought it was important to brief this committee at the high level contents of the report. We haven't obviously written the report. It's not due till the end of December. The full report will be given to this committee and the members of the College of a Board to review, but I wanted to brief you all on the specific risks that we had identified and the controls that we've identified that are mitigating those risks. Once the report is developed, we do submit it to the Department of Finance. We also, it's a public document that we post on our website. All of those things are mandated in the law. Um, going on to the next slide, I wanted to kind of give a brief overview of the risks we are going to report in comparison to the risks that we reported two years ago. So the first of all is the personnel human resource related risk. Um, our team is the key to our success also the key to risk, obviously, we all know that. So um, the risk itself has kind of transformed in the last two years, which I will explain in great detail in the next slide, but I wanted to kind of show that there, it's a similar vein, it's a similar topic, but it's obviously going to morph as the world around us changes. The last two years have been extra exciting. So, you know, we, we wanna grow our risk framework and control environment as, you know, the world changes. The second risk that we reported in 2019 is actually a risk that we will not be reporting in 2021. The second risk from 2019 was speaking to finding permanent funding sources for some of our programs. Upon the evaluation from the senior leaders and decision makers in the enterprise, we felt that this risk was being mitigated effectively and that didn't need to be present in the report. That risk will be replaced by what we're calling a housing finance administration, and I'll review the details of that later on. And the one risk that is consistent, obviously this committee finds it to be very important by the last briefing that just happened, 
is our data security and information security. Not only is it a vital risk for us to be a trusted resource in, in the marketplace and what we do and having our customers trust us and believe in our processes, it's also a very dynamic risk that is constantly changing and we must meet, meet the moment and be adaptive to it. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide where I'm gonna expand on that human resources risk. So my personal preference on when we talk about risk and enterprise risk is to start with the why and to start with the business function that we are needing to execute because risks are really what are those things that are going to get in our way to execute that business function. So we need to start in that space. So the functional objective that we've created is to establish and maintain a knowledgeable and qualified workforce. And then obviously the risk is our inability to do that with the ultimate impact being we would not be able to execute our business objectives effectively. I'm gonna say this for every single risk, just because I wanna make sure that the point is heard. We are not inappropriately managing any sort of risk in the enterprise. Our controls are strong and effective and all of our risks are being managed to an appropriate level. You can never eliminate risk in an organization. We all know that. So we have to find that balance between control and consistency as well as performance. So all of these risks, I'm gonna say it again, are being managed at an appropriate level. We will not be reporting that any risk needs ongoing, you know, a current mitigating effort. So as you can see, there's a variety of ways that we are managing this risk. The reason why it changed from 2019 over to 2021 was we wanted to expand it and we wanted to kind of bring it to a higher level that we had originally identified a succession planning and workforce planning, but over the last two years, we've done a lot of evaluation. We've put a lot of processes in place around documenting processes, sharing information. And so we wanted to bring it up to that more enterprise level rather than more of a functional operational level risk. And the overall enterprise level risk is that we don't have the right people in the right places with the right training. And so that's where we really want to monitor the risk at and really focus our mitigating efforts around. The next, next risk I'm not going to really go over because we just had a briefing on the next slide um, is the data security. I think if you had any hard questions, you should have asked them to Ashish because, you know, I'm the nice one. But I mean, if you have questions, obviously I will answer them. Um, I do want to call out our, you know, we have a very robust um, training around fraud, around info security with MRP specifically, every vendor we have and working on that program is also being trained. We take it very seriously. We had a very robust fraud assessment done and the College of info security has to work hand in hand with the mortgage release info security team and technology team in order to make sure both systems are secure and information is properly held and stored and accessed. Um, and so we also do routine the phishing test with our own staff. We all know info security, the main enter, entry point of that risk is staff. So we want to make sure that staff is most up to date and fish, they get creative, they get, you know, innovative, which we like in our own team, but we don't like in the cyber hacking. So we got to make sure everyone's up to date on that stuff. The and, last, and, oh, go ahead. This is Michael. What's the Information Security Council? So it's a council that was formed prior to me starting. I'm not sure the exact date. Um, I've been here about a year. So, and it's made up of all of the, what I call the second line of defense uh, leaders in the agency. So the oversight bodies, which would be legal. Um, it would be my role. It would be information security. Dawn sits on that. And so it's an operational committee of the agency. We review the information security policies, procedures, we go into detail of every phishing campaign, what was the outcome. We strategize if we need to release more training, if we are seeing any trends. Okay, moving on to our last risk that we'll be recording in 2021. So this is the new one. Um, the functional objective of this risk is to ensure that Cali HFA stays relevant in the marketplace provides a, and provides a positive impact in addressing the housing needs of Californians. The last two years have been kind of unpredictable and I don't think that's nor I think that's the norm for the housing market. I think that we, you know, try our best to read the tea leaves and understand what's going on. But what we really felt was important to message is the enterprise risk of us not being able to stay relevant or make that positive impact. 
Again, we are not in risk of you know this being a reality. We are committed. We have strong controls and mitigations in place and are effectively managing the risk. But we thought that it was essential for us to be open and transparent that it takes a constant effort and a constant level of being innovative to ma maintain relevancy in this industry. That we work with a lot of different people and in a lot of different facets, but we have to make sure that we're evaluating our practices and evaluate and looking for new opportunities to make sure that we are continually completing our essential mission as an organization. So in this, I kind of broke down the controls to give you an idea of the different areas that we're working towards this. So first, I like to talk about the internal evaluation. We're constantly looking at our programs. Our programs are obviously set up with a lot of policies and decisions that we've made. And we need to continually look at that and say, is this relevant for this time and place? And so I listed a lot of different things that we've actually done in the most recent times to make sure that our products are impactful and relevant to helping address the needs, the housing needs of Californians. And that's around, you know, looking at the down payment assistance cap or looking at limits around the acreage, looking at an enhanced home buyer assistance program that will really help, you know, Californians be able at a certain AMI to reach that goal of home ownership. The second kind of control area that I want to highlight is kind of our seizing the opportunity. There's a risk called, you know, the risk of latent opportunities that we don't come, you know, we don't seize the moment. And we're always looking to be innovative and just and kind of push the envelope, to be honest. Why do we have to do it this way? Can we do something different? Can we be innovative in the marketplace? And that's where really we want to be. We talked about an MRP, you know, we wanted to find that niche, that untapped resource or that Californians need help. Same with our programs now, it translates well over. We're looking for those opportunities to be creative by being safe and all of those things, but being creative to really meet our mission. And, you know, you guys are well aware of the ADU program, the MIP program and the Recycle Bond programs are great examples of us being innovative and looking at the environment we have and the constraints we work in and saying, where can we push the envelope and where can we make an impact? The next slide goes over kind of the last two control areas that I want to highlight, which is our partnerships. We can't do anything without key relations and partnerships. We work, in, we don't work in a silo. We work in a network of people and we recognize that. And our strong partnerships are key to our success. And we're going to continually value those and grow those. Um, with federal federal advocacy, um, you know, the FFB program, et cetera. And we need to maintain those healthy relationships and those dialogues in order to maintain relevancy. And the last is us being creative with our targeted marketing and outreach. I learned a lot in the MRP space of how do we reach these communities that we prioritize and whatnot. And we're taking those lessons learned and applying them to our own practices within Calership Bay. And I think that's a great growth opportunity for our marketing and communications team and the outreach that we do. I think we do a wonderful job, but there's never, you know, you, you die if you don't start stop growing. So, you know, we're going to take that to heart. And, you know, the Building Black Wealth Initiative is a great opportunity for us to identify that community that we really want to reach with our programs and be able to get to that way. That concludes my presentation on the SLAY update. I welcome any questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, you did slay that, so mm -hmm. we've... <laughs> okay, I will only do that one more time. <laughs> um, you can do it till December 31st, and then we have to close that. <laughs> so, um, actually, that, that's a good segue to my question. Um, you know, to the extent that this is a, a report that's going to be submitted and, um, you know, creates an opportunity for us to uh, measure our performance against the report. Um, I'm just, you know, wanted to reach out to Tina and see, Tina, is it possible to maybe take elements of this report and report back to the board of directors or to the audit committee uh, on a periodic basis to see how we're doing um, in these areas and to see if there's any updates with regard to the innovation, for example, or new ideas for, um, you know, what we're doing in the following year. It, yeah. Is there something to make this a living document? 
I think we, we absolutely can. And I believe, um, I don't want to get too far out in front because Don and I were discussing this this morning, but I'm going to ask Don to sort of share some high level thinking on where we think we might be going uh, in that regard. Um, I, I think if I, if I hear your question correctly, Chair Satello, I, I think one thing that we could do to sort of make it a, a living document that would allow it to sort of have regular updates is just like in the current uh, board meeting uh, package, we have a lot of informational reports. We could begin to include like a quarterly update or something of that nature on, on the progress on certain elements of the SLAY as just a, a standard sort of reporting arrangement that we, we put in place. So that, that would be one thought that I think could probably adequately address what you brought up there. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'll defer to Chair Gunning on, on whether that presentation, maybe uh, we pull out one of those reports um, to give the board an opportunity to, to dialogue and to participate in their own ideas around uh, innovation and you know, leadership opportunities. Because I think it's important to, to, to solicit from board members um, the ideas that they have with this work within this if I, if I could one one other additional thought I have as well is that that um, you know not only I think Rebecca could bring you know the slay in a more you know sort of the, at the more complete juncture to the board and present do a presentation similar to this and open it up for comments and questions from the board members but um, I think also this is an area that that obviously finds its way in a variety of ways in business plan and so that as we do our workshop the business plan we can have some focused conversations around this space as well that's a great idea yeah i like that okay. so treasurer ma uh chair gunning any any other comments or questions no i like that thought i i think the board should benefit from the exercise and know about it and then putting it as a report is a good thought doc No additional comments from the treasurer. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, uh, let's, um, we have about, um, I, I'd like to end it in about five minutes just to give folks uh, a little time before the next board meeting. Um, but um, if we can just pull up the charter very quickly, um, item number seven, um, it has been brought to my attention that one of the things that we might want to take a look at uh, with regard to the charter is identifying a fourth alternate member um, to the committee, one that is not active, uh, actively sitting um, and voting at each meeting, but rather is available should there be a need for an alternate uh, to participate. Um, much like we have, um, you know, Mr. Starr um, as an alternate to the treasurer, we could have an alternate to the board, I mean, to the to the committee um, in the case of, you know, a lack of quorum. Um, and, you know, if in fact we have to adopt an audit or um, we have to, you know, take a take an action um, and we don't have a quorum. So that's one of the areas that was brought to my attention as a potential uh, modification of the charter. Um, as you will know, if um, Melissa, you moved move uh, down on the charter a little bit in terms of the the meeting minutes. I'm sorry, in terms of the meeting frequency. Um, the other area is um, potentially if you can move back up. I think um, we are to have at least two audit committee meetings a year. Um, I've I've talked to the team about potentially adding a third one. Should it be necessary, and um, you know, should it be able? To, should we be able to, um, you know, add that maybe um, during the summer? It, it it would just potentially afford us another opportunity uh, to take take a look at the timing and take a look at the audit and take a look at um, you know being able to work with um, either Rebecca. Or or Don um, as other items to the to the committee become relevant. So uh, we don't need a charter change for that, but potentially adding a third meeting, uh, which may or may not you know take place, is something that I think we will look at for 2022. 
especially if we keep um, if, if we're continuing to meet on a virtual basis as opposed to a physical basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, committee members, are there any other potential um, modifications to the charter that, that you would suggest? No, I love that thought, Chair Sotelo. I had I wonder why I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good and it makes sense right um and and plus it helps to build the team as well so it's i like that idea uh, Justice uh, Hall, may i uh, address one of your comments please sure, sure thank you for the opportunity um with respect to your first suggestion about possibly expanding um the audit committee membership from three individuals up to four i just wanted to make sure that everyone was clear on the process the charter itself under a, the authority paragraph makes reference to board resolution 0608, which was passed in 2006 before um, many of us had any interaction with CalHFA. But uh, the, guarding, the um, guiding resolution uh, now designates uh, three members of the audit committee. So if we wanted to expand that uh, just for um, explaining the mechanics of how we would do that, it would need to be taken back to the board and approved by the, the full board. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you so much. And, and can I ask a clarifying question about that one too, uh, please? Um, I, I would just like to understand too, if, if we do the alternate scenario with the intent operationally that the alternate who's identified and approved, you know, uh, through the full board would then receive uh, all the packages on a regular basis um, so that they're sort of in tune with what's going on with the audit committee and what's happening. Um, so that if they have to serve or jump in, they're not they're not coming into it cold and blind. Um, yeah. Would that be the intent? Yes, um, uh, yes, that's definitely the intent. And the idea would be that again, it would just be someone who would step in um, should one of the the members not be available. Got it. Got it. And then a, a second question too. I just wanted to comment that I think um, you know us sort of creating three meetings, you know. Needed. I just wanted to mention that there's no prohibition of the committee to have as many meetings as you want to have in a given year. Although I would encourage that we don't have a ton, but I'm just going to say <laughs> that you can do more than three, you can do four or whatever is needed. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. Um, so, um, point tech, well taken. Um, so, with regard to the membership, um, I think that um, if we're going to move forward with that, we will place it either on the board agenda um, in January potentially, and or our next committee meeting uh, so that we can adopt any modifications to the uh, membership of the charter committee, I mean of the audit committee. Uh, Ms. Sotelo, may I make one more comment, please? Sure. Uh, thank you for giving us the time to consider this between now and um, I guess late December. I would want to make sure that there are no prohibitions, and I, and I haven't looked at this, about having, I guess, what would be the equivalent of, um, and I guess the alternate would be a named voting member of the Cali Tefe board. Is, is that your conception? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, if I may uh, ask for a little bit of time to research uh, the propriety of doing that and how we would go about doing that, I would appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is a suggestion that, that, um, Again, um, I, I thought to bring to the board, I mean, to the committee uh, for consideration. So there's nothing set in stone. So if it's workable, that's great. So um, we'll give um, freedom to the staff to take a look at that and see if it's a viable solution. And, and certainly work with Tina as, as we think about uh, what, the, what the purpose of the, the membership would be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Absolutely. Great. Um, so with that, um, Melissa, do we have any public comment um, or any members of the public wishing to speak? So if we have any members of the public that would like to speak, um, if you could um, raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. I am not seeing any hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, any other comments from staff or from members of the committee? 
Um, I have a quick comment. I know we want to end right now at five minutes, but my quick comment it just dawned on me that I believe this is going to be Lori Hamahashi's last audit committee, and I wanted to um, identify that and <laughs> Lori. say something to her because she's on, on the verge of retirement in the next month, and so she's going to be very much missed. And she's been oh a uh, institution on calendar phase audit for many years. So yes, yes, I'm so sorry. I would embarrass her on that. <laughs> all in, let's all embarrass her. <laughs> I, I didn't know if I was going to say anything. Uh, <laughs> hey, I didn't either. It just came to me. <laughs> Have a second chance. You can say no, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's been wonderful working here for like the past. It, it's been, I, I think, close to 30 years okay. here. So it's time. It's time. Um, this is started eight, when you were five. I am. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like my right arm has been cut off. So, anyway. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really like my second family here. I mean, a lot of the people I work here work together for so many years here. Um, you know, I got neighbors that come and go, but you know, the family here, they're just, I mean, they're still fun to come in and, and see every day and work with. And, you know, we have our little sibling uh relationships <laughs> <laughs> well, Lori, you you are going to be a very hard act to follow you have been so uh patient and uh you know just clear in, in your communication about very complicated topics so we really so appreciate it Lori. and thank you for thank your you time. Thank, thank you thank you Lori. on your retirement yes. awesome. thank you <laughs> well, on that sad note, <laughs> Tina, <laughs> um, can I go ahead and ask for an adjournment, a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I move. Wonderful. Okay. So with that, I'll second and um, we're considered adjourned. Thank you. So if everybody if everyone can quickly jump off and and log into the general board meeting now we're going to need to get started pretty quickly so thank you Great. thank you bye bye, bye. bye. bye.